Finally, I won't have to see your face anymore. Freeloader, get out. You should be grateful that we tolerated your freeloading, parasitic lifestyle until now. I see, I understand. I'll leave then. Thank you for everything until now. I quickly packed my belongings and left the house where I had been living with my in-laws. I noticed my mother-in-law looking at me with the happiest face as I was leaving. I left looking all sorrowful, but only I knew about. What awaited this house next? My name is Emily. I'm a 32-year-old who works from home. It has been five years since I married John. We lived happily as a couple, but around our fourth year of marriage, things started to change. My previously healthy father-in-law suddenly fell ill, and we had to start caring for him. Therefore, we moved in with my in-laws. We thought we wouldn't have to live with them for quite some time, but John was an only child. With no siblings to rely on, we inevitably ended up taking care of my father-in-law. I even considered quitting my job for caregiving. However, perhaps because my hard work was recognized, I was allowed to work from home and continue working. Life in my in-law's house started off hectically, but problems soon arose. Yes, it was the harassment from my mother-in-law. The common mother-in-law and daughter-in-law problems that you often hear about also fell on me. Emily? How long are you going to slack off and leave the housework alone? Get to tidying and preparing the meal already. Mother-in-law, I'm not goofing around, you know. What are you talking about? You're always clicking away at your computer. Surfing the web, you call it? You must be goofing off. The idea that being on a computer equals killing time is so old-minded. I was specially granted permission to work from home. I didn't want to waste the skills I had worked hard to acquire, so I worked hard at my job in between household chores and caregiving to maintain my previous income. And it was gratifying when, after about three months of desperate effort, I was able to restore my income. The reason why I had to work so hard was because, frankly, it was difficult to get by on John's income alone. Finally, we're going to have some leeway in our lives. I want to save some money. That's what I thought, but for some reason, life became harder. It felt like our savings was only decreasing. I wondered why, and when I checked our expenses, it turned out that John was splurging a lot. And I also found out that my mother-in-law was also splurging quite a bit. John has always been a show-off, and he often treats his colleagues to lunch, but recently he's been using our credit card to treat many colleagues at parties. Of course, if you spend more than you put in the house, it's bound to decrease. My mother-in-law, for her part, takes up multiple hobbies at the invitation of her friends, and she unhesitatingly uses money for class fees and expenses for socializing. With both my husband and my mother-in-law throwing housework and caregiving duties at me and splurging as they please, I couldn't take it anymore. As I was covering all the living expenses with my income and couldn't even think about saving, I became anxious and decided to talk to my husband and mother-in-law. Both John and mother-in-law, you seem to be spending a lot of money wastefully lately. We're going to run out of savings at this rate, so could you please hold back a bit on spending? Upon saying this, my husband John and my mother-in-law strongly rebutted. You think I wouldn't care if my colleagues see me as a stingy man? You want me to get looked down upon? It's okay if you're not always the one to treat them. Besides, even if you don't show off sometimes, they won't think you're stingy. I'm always considerate towards the people at my office to make sure we all work well together. You wouldn't understand anything about work. It's fine to treat your colleagues to lunch, but how does taking your colleagues to a girl's bar on your dime relate to work? Aren't you just doing it because you enjoy it? How do you know that? You always come home drunk and happily report it yourself, don't you? That's just how much more fun he is compared to talking with you. Mom, you get it too, right? That's what I meant. I, too, attend my classes to spend my dwindling time having fun with my friends. Are you telling me to stay cooped up at home? You're such a terrible wife. There's no reason for you, 
who don't even earn a cent and only do housework, to tell me what to do. Really, what is she thinking? Acting all high and mighty when she's just a housewife. I do work. And you guys know it. I'm earning and contributing to the household, you know. I'm also taking care of your father, not just doing housework. Don't lie. My mom takes care of my dad, and since you're not even going to the office, you're not earning much, are you? Who the hell do you think you are? Getting all cocky just because you work part-time. Stunned, I was lost for words. It seemed like this mother-son duo really didn't understand that I was truly working and taking care of the house and father-in-law, all while earning. Moreover, my mother-in-law seemed to have told John that she was the one taking care of my father-in-law, making me look like a lazy housewife. I considered leaving several times. But the reason I refrained was, of course, my father-in-law. My father-in-law has always been very kind to me since I got married to John. And he would always say, Emily, I'm really sorry that a great daughter-in-law like you has to put up with so much. Father-in-law? I don't mind taking care of you. What are you talking about? I do feel guilty about needing care, but I feel even worse about how my wife and son are treating you. You're being taken advantage of, aren't you? Well, yes. With just John's income, we wouldn't be able to maintain a living. I know that it's all thanks to your hard work that we're getting by. Father-in-law. You knew? It turned out that my father-in-law had been aware of the household situation for a long time. And every time he needed care, he would thank me and speak to me with a kind voice. I loved my father-in-law, and I didn't find taking care of him a burden at all. What if I left this house? I was anxious about who would take care of my beloved father-in-law, so I decided to take care of him diligently until he passed away. And about a year later, my father-in-law passed away. During the funeral of my father-in-law, whom I loved so much, I cried the whole time. Seeing me, my mother-in-law coldly said, Emily, why are you crying so much? Without shedding a tear, my mother-in-law showed no signs of grieving for my father-in-law. So, of course, I replied, What? My father-in-law has passed away. Of course I would be sad. I've been taking care of him all this time. Upon hearing my response, my mother-in-law exploded in anger. Gosh! As if I didn't take care of my husband at all! In reality, my mother-in-law hardly took care of my father-in-law. She took advantage of me, doing neither housework nor caregiving, and claimed she was too busy with her hobbies. Despite that, she always found the time to go out. She played the part of the poor mother-in-law being bullied by her daughter-in-law, even pretending to cry in front of the relatives. From the outside, it seemed like I was a terrible daughter-in-law, to the point where people said, Please stop being so harsh on your mother-in-law. Please stop being so harsh on your mother-in-law. Some even sided with her and blamed me. I was merely grieving the death of my father-in-law, yet even strangers blamed me. It pissed me off, I chose to stay away from our relatives. Then, John, having noticed me, approached me to complain. So, you embarrassed my mom in front of our relatives, huh? What are you talking about? I don't understand. I was just crying and grieving your dad's death. Then your mom came up to me making snide comments, that's all. I heard you were talking as if she did nothing for my dad. I didn't say such a thing. I was just talking about how sad I was that your dad, who I had been taking care of, passed away. Maybe it sounded like I was blaming your mom because she didn't do anything, in reality. Are you looking down on my mom? No. I'm just telling the truth. And if you're so upset, you should have helped me out. Don't you think you could have taken better care of your own dad? Why are you blaming me too? I have nothing to do with this. Nothing to do with this. You're his own son. Didn't you feel any responsibility to take care of him? I had work. It was your job, 
as a housewife to take care of him. That makes no sense. I have work too, so that's unfair. Our argument heated up and was broken up by panicked relatives. Although the argument ended there, my husband and I didn't speak for the rest of the day. Later, after all the funeral-related matters were settled, a lawyer spoke about the inheritance. I'd like to discuss the will concerning the inheritance following your father-in-law's death. It is written that the rights to the family home and land will go to his son, John, while the remaining money will be split evenly between his wife and his daughter-in-law, Emily. What? Why would Emily get a part of the inheritance? I'm his wife, right? If John gets the land and the house, shouldn't the rest of the assets all be mine? Your husband expressed his gratitude to Emily, who dedicated herself to his care. It is his wish to leave her part of the inheritance as a token of that gratitude. This is a decision made by your husband, and it cannot be overturned. So that's it. Oh, I see. Emily was only taking care of him because she was after the inheritance. Why would you say that? It must be. Why else would she dedicate herself to caregiving? I've had a good relationship with my father-in-law ever since we got married. I took care of him to repay his kindness. If you think it's impossible, why did you push the caregiving onto me, mother-in-law? How can you belittle me like that? Don't talk crap. I get it now, so keep your mouth shut. With our lawyer present, my mother-in-law couldn't say anything inappropriate, so she continued with a frustrated expression. So, he decided that. Well, it's a token of appreciation for caregiving. I guess there's no other way. Then, the lawyer continued with the discussion. May I continue? Your father-in-law left a note saying that Emily no longer needs to take care of him. At that moment, my mother-in-law's face, which had been bitter up to then, suddenly lit up with a smile. That's it. That's what it means. I understand now. Huh? What do you mean? Confused by his mother's excitement, my husband seemed completely at a loss. It means that Emily is no longer needed in this house since she won't have to take care of my husband. The reason for dividing the inheritance was just severance pay, not gratitude. My mother-in-law twisted my father-in-law's will according to her own speculations. My mother-in-law misunderstood my father-in-law's will as my father-in-law and I had intended it to be misunderstood. Actually, there was a discussion between my father-in-law and me while he was still alive. My father-in-law wished to set me free from this house after his death. He planned to use his will to fool my husband and mother-in-law, allowing me to leave the house without any trouble. And, just as my father-in-law intended, my mother-in-law, who was completely fooled, is trying to kick me out. While making sure they did not catch on to my true feelings, I pretended to be shocked by the will, saying, Oh, father, why would you do such a thing? See, even my husband didn't see you as his precious daughter-in-law. John, you don't need Emily anymore, do you? Just divorce her already. John? You wouldn't say something like divorce, right? I looked at John with tearful eyes. After a long pause. Indeed, it seems better to divorce. He finally said. Me? I've received the family property and mom has got the money. I don't need to worry about care in the future, and I won't have any trouble without Emily. What? I see. That's how it is. Sorry, but could you leave me? Understood. I guess there's no place for me anymore here. I meekly said as I took a piece of paper from my drawer and handed it to my husband. When we had a fight before, there was one time I went to pick this up. That, of course, was the divorce papers. My husband immediately signed the divorce papers. Finally, I don't have to see your face. A freeloader who doesn't work, get out. Appreciate that I put up with a parasite like you all this time. I see. Okay. I'll leave. Thank you for everything so far. Speaking of which, since the lawyer is here, I want to discuss. 
It's okay if there's no property division, right? I've received enough from my father-in-law's inheritance. That's right. How considerate of you, Emily. I've been able to live on my earnings. It would be brazen of you to want more. Well, you're right. All right. The discussion is over. Please leave this house as soon as possible. I quickly packed my belongings and left the house where I had been living. My mother-in-law was watching me leave with a joyous face beyond words, not knowing what awaited in this house. After leaving the in-law's house, I immediately submitted the divorce papers to the city hall. Arriving at the apartment I had rented in advance, I shouted in the wide room alone. Yes! I've finally been set free! I'm free! I just couldn't help but yell. I was so happy to be free from the painful married life. I can't thank my father-in-law enough, who planned the escape from that house. Since then, I've been enjoying a too comfortable life alone. I adapted to working remotely at my in-law's place. But now that I left, I now have much more time to dedicate to my work. My income has increased due to that, and I'm able to live a luxurious life without being disturbed by anyone. One day, I got a call from my ex-husband, John. It's been a while. What brings you to call me? Emily, please help us. We're having a tough time making ends meet. Is this some kind of joke? Weren't you the ones who told me to get lost? Even though we're getting the same salary as before, for some reason, we don't have enough money. We can't live like this. Oh dear, haha, <laughs> that does sound tough. I decided to drop the final bombshell. Well, that's because my salary isn't going into the household anymore. What do you mean? Don't you understand? You couldn't afford your lifestyle just with your salary. All those splurging, and you never noticed? I couldn't afford our lifestyle with my salary alone. Of course not. You've always been squandering all your salary on yourself. The only reason we could get by was because of the money I was bringing in. You and your mother, at your ages, your habit of spending is just ridiculous. What? So how much were you making, Emily? Let me see. Back then, it was around $4,800 a month, I guess. You were making that much. Yes, I was. Bet you didn't know that, did you? By the way, now that I don't have any hindrances, I'm making even more, haha. <laughs> even over the phone, I could tell my ex-husband was shaken. Emily, how about we live together again? Huh? It was a mistake to kick you out. It's not too late to start over, right? What are you talking about? It's obvious you're just after my earnings. No, that's not it. I've realized that I still love you, Emily. Don't talk nonsense. I have no desire to return to your place. By the way, what happened to the inheritance your mother received? You should have plenty left from that, right? Well, it's nearly run out. There's no way. She got about $100,000, right? There's no way you could have spent all of it in such a short period of time. We enjoyed shopping and overseas trips. Also, we lost nearly half of it in casinos. Both of you are just hopeless. I'm speechless. I'm a stranger now, I can't do anything about it, and I don't want to. But don't say such cool things, help us. I don't care. I'm ending this call. Don't call me again. With that, I hung up the phone and immediately cancelled the contract of his phone. I have no idea what happened to my ex-husband and ex-mother-in-law after losing all means of communication. However, when I passed by their house nearly a year after that phone call, the place had been demolished. They must have had to let go of the house due to financial troubles. Well, it's none of my business anyway. As for me, I decided to spend my newfound free time on a new hobby and started attending a wine class that I had been interested in. There, I met a man two years older than me who was actively pursuing me. After a year and a half of dating, we got married. 
He's a humble and warm-hearted man who is a rising star at a well-known company and earns a high salary. He respects my work and we have a happy married life where we respect each other. Lately, I've been thinking that perhaps this reward was a gift from my father-in-law. Because I've been leading a self-indulgent life without looking after myself. Grace, the elderly woman I visited for home care, sighed as if she had known this was coming all along. The news had arrived that Grace's estranged son had passed away. Grace went back to her room and said, Please, leave me alone for a while. I could faintly hear Grace sobbing inside the room, but I couldn't think of any words to comfort her. Having lost my son before, I knew from experience that no words of encouragement could touch the heart at such a time. I left a sandwich in front of her room and wrote a note saying, Please eat a little, if you can. An hour later, Grace called me in. Thank you for the sandwich. It was delicious. She had a bright face as if she had wiped away all her sadness. It seemed like she was putting on a brave face not to worry me. Grace, with her usual calm expression, said, Chloe, I hate to ask, but could you go to the office and submit the death certificate for my son? It's hard to get around in a wheelchair. Understood, I'll take care of it. Having lost my own son, Stephen, just a year ago, I was more than willing to help. After completing the paperwork without any issues, Grace called me in again and said, Chloe, you have really taken good care of me this past year. Thank you. But you don't have to worry about me anymore. You can stop coming from tomorrow. Today will be your last day. I felt a darkness envelop me. How am I supposed to raise my young grandson William from now on? My name is Chloe, in my 60s. Once, in my 30s, I dated a man named Thomas, and we had a son together. We'll build a wonderful family together, the three of us. That was my promise, but... Somewhere along the line, everything went wrong. As soon as Thomas and I got married, his once kind demeanor completely changed. He started to vent his frustrations on Stephen and me when work didn't go well. Complaints about dinner being late, the child's crying being annoying, and lashing out at us over any little thing that didn't go his way. At first, I tried to endure it, but Thomas's behavior only got worse day by day. His outbursts became so uncontrollable that not even my voice could reach him, and I too started to feel cornered. Enough is enough. I can't follow you any further. It's one thing for me, but I don't want Stephen to suffer the consequences. Wanting to protect young Stephen from the fallout, at 40, I decided to divorce Thomas. Do as you please. If you think you can survive on your own, then go ahead. I understood Thomas's warning, but my desire to escape the harsh reality was stronger, so I took young Stephen and left the house. Stephen was just six years old then, barely starting elementary school. After finding a small, affordable apartment and finishing the move, can I really raise Stephen to be a fine person on my own? I watched the setting sun and wondered. But seeing Stephen's carefree smile made all those worries dissipate like fog. Stephen, from now on, it's just you and mom, but we'll make it through. And I promised. Stephen would amusingly share various events from school, and I never felt the hardship. I started working part-time at a supermarket to support us, and when I came home tired, Stephen would run up to me and massage my shoulders. Thank you always. Stephen, you're really thoughtful and kind. It's nothing. It's because you always work so hard for me, mom. His words would instantly lift all the fatigue of the day. However, living on a part-time income only increased my anxiety about the future. Thinking about Stephen's school fees and entrance exams, it was clear that things would get financially tighter. So, I decided to boldly step into the caregiving profession. With an aging society, the demand for caregivers would only grow, and if I could get the qualifications, I wouldn't have to worry about food on the table. Convinced of this, I worked as a caregiver while acquiring various related qualifications. Even as Stephen entered his sensitive teenage years, he grew into the same pure-hearted child and started part-time work in high school. I didn't want to overburden Stephen, who was preparing for exams, but he would smile and say, This is for my own good. Part-time work is part of learning about society. It will surely help me when I look for a job later. After graduating from high school, Stephen got a job at a small local factory. Around this time, 
Stephen had a fateful encounter with a woman. She was an office clerk at the same company, Isabella, who was two years younger than Stephen. It's nice to meet you. My name is Isabella, and I'm dating Stephen. I was convinced that she would be a good match for Stephen and blessed their relationship from the bottom of my heart. Moreover, Isabella was four months pregnant with Stephen's child. I'm becoming a grandmother already. So I joked. Reflecting on my past, I had Stephen in my mid-30s, which was close to being a late pregnancy. The childbirth and parenting were quite challenging, considering they were still in their 20s. If you ever have any trouble, feel free to consult me. I won't hesitate to help in any way I can. I offered my support to the young couple, hoping they wouldn't have to endure the hardships I did. Thank you so much, Chloe. Isabella came to cherish me like her own mom. Especially since she had lost her parents just before her marriage, a time when she felt very vulnerable. Soon after getting married, Stephen and Isabella rented an affordable apartment nearby. Half a year later, Isabella gave birth to a healthy boy. They named him William. William, it's your grandmother. Nice to meet you. I couldn't help but smile as I looked at William. I wonder who he resembles. Does he have Stephen's nose? It's too early to tell. Stephen said with a wry smile next to me, and the nurse laughed amusingly. Following the birth, Isabella decided to quit her job and focus on raising her child. I can't be left behind. Wanting to support Isabella in any way, I spent my savings on baby supplies. Isabella was astonished when she returned home from the hospital. Wow, Chloe. When did you manage all this? She was so touched that she started laughing at the entrance. Stephen commented with an amused voice. It seems like you're going to spoil the grandchild. I didn't mind what anyone said. Of course, Stephen's child would be dear to me. Isabella, if you ever have trouble with childcare, call me anytime. I'll come running. I said earnestly, but Stephen coolly retorted. You just want to see William, don't you, Mom? Caught me. I could only respond with a wry smile. When William turned three and began to walk and talk on his own, Isabella started working part-time to support the family. During weekdays, she would leave William at a childcare center and pick him up in the evening after her part-time job. To lighten her load, I eagerly took on the role of babysitting William on weekends. As I played horseback rides with William on my back. Don't get too carried away. You're not young anymore, you might hurt your back. Don't treat me like an old lady. I still feel young at heart. I need you to stay healthy for me, Mom. At least until William grows up and gets married. Stephen's roundabout way of showing care deeply touched me, despite my aging body. Five years had passed since Stephen and Isabella's marriage. One day, Stephen approached me with an unusual seriousness. Mom, there's something I want to ask of you. Never having asked for anything from his parents before, Stephen's request made me nervous. What's with the formal request? We've been married for five years now, and we thought it might be nice to go on a trip just the two of us, to relax for a bit. Relieved by his explanation, I responded. So you're asking me to look after William while you're gone? Is that it? Would that be okay? You've finally become a bit more childlike. You never used to rely on your parents. Hey, I'm 27 years old now. Calling a 27-year-old adult childlike is a bit much. Although Stephen complained with a strong tone, his expression was smiling. Sure, go on your trip. Take your time and enjoy yourselves. Thank you, Mom. I'll make it up to you someday. With those words, Stephen and Isabella rented a car and went on their trip. However, I couldn't shake off a sense of unease that I couldn't explain. What is this anxiety? I hope nothing happens. That day, I had the day off from my caregiving job so I could spend the whole day with William. I remembered that we had an old deck of cards in the back of the closet that I bought for Stephen a long time ago. How about we play some cards? I want to play. William eagerly raised his hand in response. William quickly learned the rules of the game. You're so smart, William. You picked it up right away. It's boring to play alone. I want to play with dad and mom next time. By 9 p.m., even the energetic William had tired himself out and dozed off on the couch. You'll catch a cold sleeping there. 
I said as I picked him up and carried him to the futon in the bedroom. When did William get so heavy? I used to be able to lift him so easily. I was reminded once again of how quickly children grow. Just as Stephen said before they left, I have to live a long life, at least until William grows up and gets married. Thinking this, I gazed at William's face, now peaceful and sleep in my arms, wishing for this happiness to last forever. Then, suddenly, the phone rang. It was unusual for anyone to call me at 9 p.m. A bad premonition ran through my mind. Tentatively, I picked up the receiver, and it was from an unfamiliar regional hospital. The person on the other end spoke in a calm tone, methodically explaining the situation, but each word felt like a curse, darkening my vision. Excuse me, what are you saying? Stephen and Isabella are both in critical condition, unconscious. It's a dangerous situation that requires immediate attention. What's wrong, Grandma? William, sensing something unsettling in my somber expression, looked up at me worriedly. William, let's get changed quickly. After hurriedly dressing a sleepy William, without caring what I was wearing, I asked a neighbor to drive us to the hospital where Stephen and his wife were taken. Upon arriving at the hospital and walking down the dimly lit corridor of the emergency department, this way, the nurse led us to the ICU. Both were in the intensive care unit, motionless with tubes inserted in their mouths. Stephen! Stephen! No matter how much I called out, Stephen didn't respond, just like a doll. Mom! Mom! William also repeatedly called for his mom, but the response was the same. Eventually, without regaining consciousness, both their heartbeats stopped, and a moment of silence fell in the ICU. Breaking the silence. Stephen! I shouted the name of my beloved Stephen. In the end, both of them didn't make it. After calming down a bit, the local police hesitantly explained the situation of the accident. Unable to respond properly to a car driving the wrong way, this was the result. Their words swirled in my head, causing confusion. That night, Stephen appeared in my dream smiling and waving at me. I was incredibly angry. You idiot. You told me to live a long life until William gets married, and what about you? Why did you have to go before me? I yelled at him over and over. I wanted to run to Stephen and hug him tightly, but his intangible body slipped through my arms. Eventually, Stephen took Isabella's hand and walked into the light, heading towards heaven. You two are really foolish. When I woke up, my cheeks were wet with tears. William gently wiped them away with his hand. Don't cry, Grandma. Being comforted by William, how foolish I am. I can't stay down forever. William. Dad and Mom are gone, but from now on, it's just you and me. Let's live our lives together, supporting each other. I still have things I must do. For the sake of raising the only family I have left, William, I switched to a better-paying home care job. I was dispatched through a referral to the mansion of an elderly woman in her late 80s named Grace Smith. She seemed to be quite wealthy as the mansion was spacious, but Grace was living there all by herself. I wonder what I'll do if she's difficult to deal with. The world she lives in seemed so different from mine, it was overwhelming. Even before entering, my anxiety only grew. But I can't afford to complain when it's all for William. I chided myself for wanting to whine. The mansion was too large for one person to live in, especially since Grace had been living in a wheelchair for many years. I sympathized with Grace, thinking how hard it must be to move around such a large house. The pathway leading to the entrance had a gentle slope and handrails installed. As expected of a wealthy person, the accessibility features were impressive. When I rang the doorbell and introduced myself as a caregiver, a dignified elderly lady greeted me with a warm smile. Welcome. I am the owner of this house, Grace Smith. Nice to meet you, I'm Chloe. Your garden flowers are beautiful. I complimented the splendidly blooming flowers in the flower bed as a greeting. I was advised by a senior caregiver that it would be good to start the conversation from there, assuming she had a strong interest in flowers. As I hoped, Grace's face softened even more with a gentle and kind expression. Oh, I'm delighted to hear such words from someone as young as you. Although I felt a bit resistant to being called young, I graciously thanked her. Grace was never arrogant, she treated me rather like a family member, which made me feel at ease. From the first time we met, 
I didn't feel like you were a stranger. I wonder why. Is it because of your name? My name, Chloe? Long ago, it was the name of a woman who had a connection to me. Sorry for the unnecessary story. No, it's fine. Then, as we spent time drinking coffee, we gradually started to share stories about our lives every day. Grace's husband had passed away from an illness a few years ago, and she had been living alone in a wheelchair since. Do you have any other family? Grace looked sad as she responded. I do have a son, but he only comes by when he's short on money. It's boring to talk about this with you. I didn't know how to respond, so I just smiled awkwardly. What about your family, Chloe? I had a son, but he recently passed away in an accident. That's terribly sad. There's no greater sorrow than losing a child. Grace squeezed my hand gently to comfort me. Fortunately, I was blessed with a grandson, William. He's a five-year-old boy, quite mischievous, but he's the reason I can find the strength to keep living. That's wonderful. Having someone precious to protect is a beautiful thing. It becomes a reason to live. Grace also said, If you'd like, bring him over sometime. It must be lonely for him to stay at home alone. Taking her up on her offer, I brought William over the next weekend. Upon seeing William, Grace narrowed her eyes. Oh, this child is. And tilted her head. Is there something about William? Grace laughed off in haste. No, nothing at all, dear. It's just that, as one ages, everything seems to remind one of the past. I was curious about Grace's remark, but she didn't seem inclined to elaborate. What's your name? William. Nice to meet you. How admirable. What's your dad's name? Stephen. And your grandfather's name? William, looking puzzled, shook his head and then looked at me. William didn't know anything about his grandfather, and I had never told him anything, so he couldn't answer. I'm sorry, Grace. I've never talked to him about his grandfather. Grace smiled. I'm sorry for asking such strange questions. She said, gently patting William's head. A year after I started caring for Grace, news arrived that Grace's estranged son had passed away. Because I've been leading a self-indulgent life without looking after myself. Grace murmured with a sigh, as if she had known this was going to happen from the start. But when she returned to her room, please, leave me alone for a while. I could faintly hear Grace sobbing inside, but I couldn't think of any words of comfort to offer. Having lost my son before, I knew from experience that no words of encouragement could reach the heart at such a time. I left a sandwich in front of her room, please eat a little, if you can, and wrote a note saying. An hour later, Grace called me in. Thank you for the sandwich. It was delicious. She had a face as if she had wiped away all her sorrow. It seemed like she was trying not to worry me. Grace, with her usual calm expression, said, Chloe, I hate to ask, but could you go to the office and submit the death certificate for my son? It's hard to get around with these legs. Understood, I'll take care of it. Having lost Stephen just a year ago, I readily agreed to help. Several documents were needed to submit the death certificate. When I went to the office reception to prepare each document, I discovered an unexpected truth. The deceased son's name was listed as Thomas Smith, a name I couldn't possibly forget, the name of the man I once loved, Stephen's dad and William's grandfather. How could this? How could this? Learning this shocking truth, I suddenly cried at the reception, bewildering the staff. Are you all right? Can we help you? Trying to appear calm, I ended up with a forced, awkward smile. Struggling to stand up straight, my vision blurred, and I fainted. When I regained consciousness, I was lying on a bed in the office's medical room. I'm sorry for the trouble. Thank you. I hastily got up, overwhelmed by apology and embarrassment. Please, don't overdo it. It's tough losing a loved one. I thanked the staff repeatedly, gathered my things, and immediately returned to Grace's house. Seeing me burst in, Grace looked startled. Chloe, what's happened to you? You look so scared. I glanced at my reflection in the mirror. Despite not being angry, my expression could easily be mistaken for fury. Grace, your son's name was Thomas Smith, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. What about it? 
I swallowed hard, then took a deep breath before replying. Thomas Smith was my ex-husband. Oh. Grace let out a gasp of shock upon learning this fact. So, Chloe was really you. Tears began to well up in Grace's eyes. She then shared a truth she had kept hidden in her heart. Thomas had clashed with his wealthy father and left home right after dropping out of college. Since then, he had been estranged from his family, only starting to visit his mother after his father passed away. During that time, Thomas and I met and I became pregnant with our first son, Stephen. But when I suggested that Thomas should at least greet his parents, there's no need. I'm not showing my face at that man's place. He stubbornly refused, so I couldn't say anything more. As a result, I never met my in-laws before divorcing Thomas. Grace mentioned she had suspected when she heard the name Chloe, as I had returned to my maiden name, but she wasn't sure. I also hadn't imagined that Smith, a common surname, could be my ex-husband's family. After completing the death certificate without any issues, Grace called me again. Chloe, you've really helped me a lot over this past year. Thank you. But you don't have to come from tomorrow. Today will be your last day. The sudden notice of termination made me feel as if the ground had disappeared beneath me. How was I going to raise young William now? Sensing my unease, Grace smiled kindly as usual. Oh dear, please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying this because I've come to dislike you. I tried desperately to understand Grace's true intentions. It might be presumptuous to ask, but if you're willing, Chloe, would you consider living with me? William too, of course. Tears welled up in my eyes as I finally grasped Grace's intent. I don't mind, but are you sure? Good or bad, your family. And family should live together. Hey William, do you remember the grandma we met before? Yeah, I remember. Grandma Grace was very kind. That grandma is your grandfather's mom, your great-grandma. William tilted his head, seemingly puzzled by the concept of a great-grandma. Grandma Grace said she'd like us to live with her, the three of us. What do you think? Without hesitation, William exclaimed. Yay! I love that grandma too. And so, William and I began our new life living with Grace in her mansion. As William grew, he began to resemble Stephen more and more. William is getting so big. Watching him reminds me of Thomas as a child. Grace said, watching William with a loving gaze. Grandma Grace, let's play cards together. Let's do that. We can eat some cookies too. Perhaps it's the blood connection, but William has grown quite fond of Grace. With this strong family bond, I felt confident going out to my home care visits, knowing William was in good hands. To ensure I see William's happiness with my own eyes, I knew I had to stay healthy. On the anniversaries of Stephen and Isabella's passing, Grace, William, and I would visit their graves. Stephen, Isabella, William is doing well in school. He even won first place in a marathon recently. Isn't that great? And then, I wish I could have met Stephen while he was still alive, Grace said, standing beside me. The cemetery has become more accessible nowadays, with elevators installed throughout. Thanks to this, Grace could visit more easily in her wheelchair. Now, it's Thomas's turn. Chloe, are you sure? I squeezed Grace's hand. Thomas is an important family member who brought us all together. Without him, Stephen and William wouldn't have been born. I said, patting William on the head. I know it might be selfish of me, but if you're okay with it, Grace, could we have Stephen and Isabella's remains moved to the Smith family grave? Of course. We're family, after all. A chill seemed to pass through us as the wind blew. Aren't you cold? William moved closer to Grace, holding her hand. Your hand is warm. And your body is warm too. As we headed towards Thomas's grave, I pushed Grace's wheelchair forward.